The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben. Hey, Ilya. What's up? What's up? Uh, it is the time for another uh, fantastic episode of the Cinematography Podcast. We've got, I think, a really great interview with two of the three cinematographers on the new movie All That Breathes. It's a uh, Academy Award nominated documentary, and you can watch it right now on HBO Max. Uh, Why three cinematographers? Well, it was a long time in the making, and Mm -hmm. the original cinematographer had to depart. And then, you know, whenever you've got a long... I actually asked this question, so we cover it in the uh, the interview. Oh, okay. Well, then, uh, yeah, don't spoil it. Let's let's let them answer for themselves. Yeah, it's actually, it's the very first question in the interview. So not to be redundant, but let's, uh, we'll we'll talk about that in the interview. But I've got a great interview with cinematographers Ben Bernhard and Riju Das. Awesome. So, Ben, it's time for our close focus. Uh, I got sort of a thing that I kind of want to talk about. Do you know what the number one movie on Netflix is right now? I do not. I've been working, so I, I haven't really been watching a lot of Netflix this week. Well, congratulations to you for uh, for having some directing work and, and working right now. That, that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear it. But right now on Netflix, the number one movie is called Two Guns, and it's a Denzel Washington, Mark Wahlberg movie Oh, that originally I- came out. And I saw with you back in 2013. Yeah, I I believe we saw it at the Arclight Sherman Oaks one night. That's correct. We wanted to see it on the big screen. And it's because I had a very small connection to the movie in that the cinematographer, uh, Mr. Oliver Wood, who is a longtime client of Hot Red Cameras and just an all around awesome guy, shot significant portions of that movie and some other movies on a hacked Panasonic GH2, which I had hacked for him way back when. I think Whoa. It was. So and he used them for insert shots and driving shots and this, that and the other. But on Two Guns, I believe the movie starts off the very first shot of of the camera on train tracks with a train driving right over the camera. And it makes perfect sense to, to do it that way because, of course, the amount of stuff that you have to go through and safety to put a very expensive camera, large 35 millimeter film camera or Aria Alexa or whatever they might have been using down in the dirt, down in the ground like that, it's considerably more effort than to drop a GH2 and uh, let the train drive over. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Which is exactly what happened. And uh, look, also, if you're making a big budget movie like that and you destroy a gh4 you know yeah it's like nothing it's like a rounding error for, for your budget versus yeah yeah for real know. yeah so but but here's i think it's really interesting that a movie from 10 years ago that by all accounts is uh is a fine movie but not necessarily uh critically loved and uh, nor was a runaway box office hit. It's not like they made a bunch of sequels of this or anything. I think it made around a hundred million worldwide, 130 worldwide. So it's like it, it, you know, it's a solid base hit for a studio, but it's not like this is a, uh, is, is a huge win. So not, not, is, a mo- not a movie that people talk about, not a movie that you hear people referencing in pitch meetings. Hey, you know, remember in two guns when they did this one shot, no, never, I've never heard anyone say that. Not maybe, a cult classic. Else. It's not like a movie either. Like, you know, Oh, it's the Rocky horror picture picture show of of you know action films it's not it's something it's like it is like many other solid movies out there a movie that came it went it it did fine but it's getting this resurgence right now i I, actually as i'm looking at netflix it slipped to number two but really it's like it's been number one for a couple of days and it wasn't on the channel before so i don't know what the number of views or streams it takes to become number one but clearly this appeared i think enough people thought i've probably never seen this I'm going to watch it. Well, how does Netflix decide what's number one? And how interesting is it that a 2013 movie seemingly out of the blue could just become that or literally overnight? Yeah, it's weird. I mean, like, obviously, uh, neither you nor I uh, know a damn thing about how they put together their algorithm that serves stuff up to people. Um, And and they don't actually make that public either. So no one really knows what this is. And they don't really release metrics all that often. But they do put that top 10 list there for anyone to look at. And uh, I, I did a couple of searches online and a couple of uh, stories did pop up, which was pretty much like, hey, look at this. A 2013 movie is is winning is the n- number one movie right now on, on Netflix, which is surprising to say the least. Yeah. And I'm sure that Mark Wahlberg and uh, Denzel Washington movies are popular on Netflix, but 
you know, I don't know that they are brand new news unless it's a new movie with one of them in it. And uh, yeah, it's it seems odd. I mean, like, here's what I don't understand about a lot of these algorithms. And we experienced a little bit of this with Audible with my series Catchers is that it was going along. It was doing fine. And I don't know what the actual numbers are. I'm basing my entire opinion on the number of times it's been rated one to five stars. But that is an indicator of how well it's doing. And some minor tweak happened to their algorithm and suddenly we shot through the roof. And I feel like it was the difference between, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's getting the number of listens that a thing of this size probably should be getting on Audible to suddenly it's like competing with much bigger stuff. And it's literally like a tweak in the algorithm. So I wonder if a movie like Two Guns, if when they put it on Netflix, it was decided, oh, we're going to feature it. If that alone would, would shoot it to number one, if they were serving it up to people, because the whole algorithm thing is about saying like, oh, you like action movies. Oh, you liked, you know, uh, Boogie Nights, you liked Training Day, so we're going to give you this thing with the stars of both of those that's an action movie. Boom, here it is. Or I wonder if it might be something that when they put it on the platform, they decided, hey, we're going to make this number one for some reason. And I don't yeah. know what what would make them choose winners or losers or if there's or, any legalities around that. I don't know. Like, you know, I, I wonder if they just really, because of the level of the stars, they put it out as a suggestion to the largest number of uh, like the lion's share of US or worldwide viewers of Netflix. I, I don't really don't understand, but it's interesting because when I think back to 2013 uh, and when this movie came out at that time, DSLR filmmaking or HDSLR filmmaking or mirrorless camera filmmaking was like, you know, it was a hot discussion. And there was yeah. there was definitely people saying like, oh, is this going to replace big cameras on movies. And I'm not saying that, you know, I, I never said that these cameras are going to replace big budget uh, studio cameras, but it is sort of the entryway into the 4K small camera being able to sit alongside other cameras. And as you move down in budgets, you certainly see smaller cameras moving up in a responsibility. But I think that today it's nowhere near as controversial to see a small camera, an inexpensive camera, working alongside the big cameras and picking up all. these shots and these pieces and these things. And it's just become de rigueur. Like, you know, it doesn't I mean, yeah, have- I think it's kind of expected that in your camera package, you're going to, you're probably going to have a drone. You're probably going to have some kind of mirrorless or mirror DSLR and you're, you're going to use them for different kinds of shots. It's normal. And, uh, Fraser Bradshaw, who I think was our third guest ever, I was, mm-hmm. uh, having lunch with him and he was talking about, how he felt like we'd kind of arrived at peak sensor where Mm. like Mm -hmm. sensors are so good across the board that really you can kind of even, you know, modestly priced ones or whatever, you can get professional results out of them. If you know what you're doing, if you, you know, it's more about the talent behind the lens than it is about the fanciness of the camera, but the, you know, the bigger cameras, your Alexas or reds or whatever, the more expensive camera systems obviously offer more than a DSLR, but you more can functionality. Yeah. More, more quality you, for sure. You can, I have seen numerous movies shot on DSLRs that you watch and you don't even think about what they were shot on. If you know what you're doing, you, you can get amazing results. But interestingly, I don't think, you know, going back to two guns days, no DSLR filmmaking didn't take over, but I will say that DSLR filmmaking, I think, forced the hand of all the camera manufacturers to offer larger sensors because they realized that's what filmmakers really wanted. Uh, I think you're right. And boy, did I think that it resulted in the sale of a lot of mirrorless SLR style cameras because uh, for a certain level of of people, particularly, you know, in the YouTube and the online crowd and some event space, that became the de facto standard. I, I can't tell you how many people I hear out there, they say, oh yeah, my first camera was like, Canon, you know, T3i or or whatever it was. And that was the least expensive, large censored camera you could buy for uh, a very long time from Canon. So anyway, they, they, I think they're up past the T7 now or something like that. There's, there's a lot of different uh, options. It's easy to get lost in it. And if you uh, listen to programs like ours or, you know, there's, there's plenty of YouTube channels or whatever that, that kind of stay up on the camera tech, I think you can kind of get the sense of what people are using. But my philosophy has always been like, buy something when you have a job to shoot it with, because if you buy it now and it take, and you don't get a job for another three months, a newer, sexier camera will be out three months from now. I'd slightly modify that. I'd say 
buy the camera a month or so before you think you need it. Give yourself plenty of time to, to learn it and figure yeah. it out. Try, and, and here's the one I love. People who try to order the brand new camera before it's even been released yet, before it's shipping at all. And then they they call up in a panic saying, I haven't received my camera and I ordered this camera. And it's like, well, you know, it's, it's not out yet. So uh, there's something yeah. to be said about actually getting slightly more mature cameras that have been on the market a little while and, and, and work a bit better. But, well, and, and I'm not saying like buy old antique cameras, but, you know, I even had a recent experience where my 5D, my Canon 5D Mark II, which is now, I think, 12 years old, was exactly the right uh, camera for a project that I was working on. So I, not to say that I wouldn't like to have a newer one, but uh, these cameras do have a decent life. Yeah, I, I will say that almost anything that you buy today is going to be current for a good length of time. I, I will tell you there's this crazy thing going on right now with a, with a Fuji camera, which you cannot buy. It's a three-year-old Fuji street photography camera is what they call it. it. Essentially has a fixed 23 millimeter lens built onto the front of it. It's called the X100V and you can pay double the actual retail price on eBay for it, but you otherwise can't buy it. And it kind of drives me crazy because we get, you know, I want to say about 10 or 15 inquiries per week, at least for this camera, because it's people who are looking all over trying to find it. There were some bloggers some vloggers some YouTubers who are like, oh, this camera is awesome. And the camera's inexpensive. And then, of course, everyone wants to buy it. But actually, Fuji makes some cameras that cost almost exactly the same money that are years newer and better. But uh, because someone somewhere said this is great. Yeah, you know, that's that's kind of how it goes. People want to have whatever sounds hot and interesting. But uh, really, even Fuji makes newer versions of that camera, which are easier to come by. I'm sure they thought that camera was about to, you know, go be put out to pasture. But enough people on YouTube said it was great. And now they have a, a demand that they can't they can't reach. So. So in summary, check out two guns on Netflix. Uh, well, yeah, you could you could say that. But I, I was going to bring it all back around to two guns is this. We don't know why it's number one. It's cool that they're the very first shot, like the literally the very first shot of the movie is on one of these cameras. But uh, what's really interesting is, is that somehow somewhere we are living in that alternate universe where a 10 year old movie that wasn't a big hit is now winning on Netflix. And I, I don't really understand how, what that is, what, like what, what it is that makes that, that happen. And uh, none of us are going to know unless uh, Netflix gets more transparent, but you know, and cool. they won't and they won't, but, but cool, cool for this, you know, uh, little tiny look and peek because I can't remember another time where uh, there was a movie that was that out of date that debuted without rising the ranks, without being like rediscovered, without being whatever. And voila, here it is. Anyway, let's get to the interview with Ben Bernhard and Riju Joss, two of the three cinematographers from uh, All That Breathes. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm joined now by two of the three cinematographers credited on the new movie, All That Breathes. Please welcome to the show, Ben Bernhard and Riju Das. Welcome to the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, I have to ask you, just because I haven't seen a movie with uh, three cinematographers credited before, how did you decide to divide duties or responsibilities? So basically, the, the film had a very long journey in how it uh, was made. So the director started working with Somo, one of the, the three of us, yeah. just to gain them in and the, the development uh, trailers and all this. And they started shooting and collecting wonderful material. And as it unfortunately is with documentary, it takes really a lot of time to fund. Years. Uh, yes, sometimes. Yeah. So, so when finally... Uh, the film got some grants. Somo was already occupied with a, a Netflix show he was supposed to do. So he was, yeah, he was unavailable, unfortunately. And he had to give it pass for this one. And uh, that was my luck. So he reached out because they're a common friend. And um, that's how I got involved. And then, I, then we started shooting. And uh, that was right after the first wave of COVID. And then the second wave hit. And we were first in lockdown. Then we got COVID. We got we had to... Of course, we stopped already before because we, the moment we realized COVID's like coming closer, I wanted to fly out, but it was too late. I was like, it got me. And yeah, and then I was in, back in Europe. I'm based in Berlin. So I was back in Europe and uh, actually wanted to return after, but then I got COVID here as well again. And uh, yeah, couldn't come. And then luckily, 
uh, Shonak found Riju to take over. And uh, so it was like, yeah, we always handed on the... Yeah, the baton, exactly. The camera. To, to keep, keep, keep it going. The camera. Uh, I love it. Riju, let, let me bring you into the, the conversation here as well, too. For our listeners who are not familiar with the movie, how would you describe All That Breathes? Well, in short, it's a film about interconnectedness and coexistence of all life on our planet. And this sort of spiritual idea being explored through the story of two brothers in Delhi. In short, it would be that, you know, it talks about how all species are equal, whether human or non-human, whether plant or animal. Uh, and that's the philosophy of the film. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a wonderful description. And uh, I watched the movie last night on, on HBO Max, where it's now uh, streaming in, in the U.S. And it's a beautiful movie. Wonderful work, gentlemen. I, I, re I really, really enjoyed it. There's a an economy. I don't say this very often about any anything that I see, but there's an economy of work that you did. It is so deliberate and so composed. I felt like there's very few shots in this movie <laughs> for a documentary is, is almost unheard of. It's you've composed and, and have these beautiful sequences of moments of life that seem to be intimate and personal and yet also relate to this this larger theme of coexistence. And I'm just wondering if you guys could talk about how the work that you did with the cinematography uh, better reflects the themes of, of what's going on in this movie. Uh, so I like to first shape reality in films and play with the form outside the normal confines uh, in my work. And I do this with Kozakowski a lot. But in this in year, in this film, the, the aspect of time was also very um, important because the idea was to not only edit from one thing to the other and finger point, but to show the coexistence and to create a an atmosphere where the audience takes part in this and doesn't get lectured mm. and where you slow down and you really yeah, show, you show me what I, I sit here and I in front of the computer and then you slowly move to the plant behind me and you show that same time there might be this ant or spider or whatever instead of editing somewhere yeah. and the audience feels tricked because you don't know where you are and, and if it's the same time. So once we sh the, the beauty of coexistence, but at the same time, we wanted to shape it in a poetic way. And yeah, and then the, the protagonists are philosophers of the urban, as, as we call it. They are beautiful beings and they, their thoughts already lift, or bring these ideas and these this topics of the film. Sure. Yeah, I mean, just I'd, I'd just like to add on to what Ben said, mentioned already. Uh, the filming, as effortless as it may seem, uh, it's never because ever of less, a fantastic yeah. edit, because of just a fantastic edit. I think the edit uh, yeah. also needs to get credited here. Um, Agreed. Yeah. As much as it feels that way, the entire team, it's not just us cinematographers, but the way the, the rest of the team were just so rigorous and just so meditative about everything. But just that the rigor that the team puts in and in terms of cinematography, it translates into putting the camera, say, on a, on a slider and just uh, shooting the same action over and over again for hours, you know, literally for hours, you know. And like Ben says, you know, you do 41 takes and then on the 42nd take, something just, just happens. And all of us feel like, wow, this is, this is what we were looking for. So, yeah, the practice that the team put in was absolutely phenomenal. I think, you know, this was something else altogether. And I guess that shows on screen. Uh, for sure. The movie has definitely one of the most uh, memorable opening shot sequences of, of any movie. I think I, I certainly any documentary I, I can recall. Did either one of you work on that that opening shot? Can you talk about that shot in particular? Because it is a, a visceral moment in the movie, I think, especially from uh, people who don't live in Delhi, who maybe don't necessarily come across that sort of urbanization. It looks to me like you are getting 
very, very close with the camera to some of your animal subjects. I don't know if it, if it was actual macro work or, or not, but it, to me, it looked like you were essentially standing in a field of rodents. You were standing, uh, you know, surrounded by, by rats. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? So, yeah, one day, uh, as Rachel mentioned, we had this uh, wonderful. We have a, we had a wonderful film family, and some of our really passionate members constantly were scouting for the non-human life in the city. Um, and one day they came with this traffic circle where the whole Middle Island was one huge nest of rats. And Sean and me, we looked, we looked at it and we were like, oh my God, we have to go there. And Sean like was like, ah, I'm not sure. Yeah, like, ah, maybe if you're, if you're excited and so on. And I was like, yeah, imagine, look at this. Because they, they, the material, they shot it from their hands. So they shot it with a human perspective. They looked down on the animals. So it was the information that there is hundreds of rats. And I was like, yeah, Sean, let's imagine that we want to give this uh, space to the non-human life in our film. So let's be on their eye level. Let's not look from our perspective. I'm very proud this shot turned out the way it did because it really for me is the essence of our style that we take the time to believe our perspective and to go into another height or another perspective of other creatures and therefore honor their being and show at the world out of their perspective out of their view and in this case we went to that traffic circle and we are uh, I had, of course, some technical ideas how to manage it and so on and how to do this and how to go from our perspective down on the, on the ground. Uh, and the first step I made on there, uh, I sank in more than knee deep because it was actually this one big nest. It was totally like loose and fragile. It was very disgusting, I have to say. So it was not possible. And then in the end, we really fought for... Yeah, to, the idea was to dance with these rats on eye level to show them against the background, uh, the backdrop of this urban life and of the night or the nightlife in Delhi, and uh, to to really leave our perspective. And I think we shot this one shot two two nights. So imagine you do this again and again and again. And I think what my secret is, what I also always, if I teach or whatever. I always look at the picture as if it would be the first time I see it. Mm. It gives you, and it motivates the panning, it not motivates the movement, it motivates the, I mean, there's so much going on. So you, it is actually in the same time. It's not a technical movement from A to B. It's a journey, each shot. And I think, therefore, you really, yeah, you film by heart, not by head. And this, I think we, we managed we, we try to achieve in every moment, and no matter if you film a human or a non-human creature in front of you and what kind of moment you witness, you try to honor and film it with your heart and with a warmth and with an openness. These interstitials, these uh, sometimes macro, these close-ups of the different almost unexpected moments of animals that that break up the primary uh, storyline. How much of that was stuff that you collected during the regular shooting process, or how much of it was stuff that you went back later and you said, oh, "Okay, now, now we've we've got the movie. Now we have to pick up these interstitials or, or pieces." Was it from the beginning? You said you were like, "Oh, here's an interesting snail," or "Here's this interesting moment. Should we capture this for the documentary?" And so, as you were going along, you were collecting these pieces, or was it very conscious, like almost like a, a splinter unit or or a way to set up later to then go back and capture some of these moments, sort of like the the opening shot. Well, I think it was all very spontaneous, you know, like while we were shooting the brothers, we were also continuously open and kept our eyes and ears open about, for example, if you look at the uh, one of the initial shots of mosquitoes on, in a puddle of water, you know, we, we had just reached the location and we had just reached where uh, the brother's clinic is, where they stay and uh, where one of the brothers stays with his family. And just as we were about to enter the house, I saw this puddle of water, which was completely covered by uh, tiny mosquitoes. And we were like, you know, let's let's just get this. So I think it was it wasn't so structured, uh, the shooting. 
but very spontaneous, you know. You go to shoot somewhere and you see some interesting creature and, you know, the idea was always to uh, to look at life from their perspective as well. So we would use like probe lenses, macro lenses and all to get like really close to uh, those creatures and try to look at life from their, literally from their level. So it was all very spontaneous. But yeah, uh, changing the perspective, it's incredibly effective. I, I really enjoyed this aspect of, of the movie. Uh, gentlemen, I, I know that we are, uh, we're out of time, but I'm really glad that we got to speak and uh, you got to give us a little more context for, for the movie. And it's a wonderful accomplishment. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Ilya. Thanks a lot. All right, so that was the uh, two-thirds of the cinematography team behind the the new Academy Award-nominated feature, uh, All That Breathes, so currently uh, showing on HBO Max. Thank you, Ben and Riju, for coming on the show. Awesome, awesome. So, Ben, guess what time it is? What time would that be? It's time to thank our sponsor, Aperture, maker of uh, fine LED lights, including one of the lights I want to talk about today. This is a light which I don't think gets enough love called the Amaran 200X. And uh, what, what can you tell me about that light? It is a bicolor, meaning it's got both the daylight part of the spectrum, which is a, a bluer part of the spectrum, and a tungsten light, which is the warmer part of the spectrum, uh, built into this one unit. And it's got a knob on the back so you can adjust your white light between very blue and very warm and somewhere in the middle. And uh, it's a really affordable bright light. It, I mean, it uses about 200 watts of power, but outputs in a, a massive, massive amount of light. And for someone out there who's looking for uh, something entry level, but needs to kick out a ton of uh, photons, this is going to be a, a unit to consider. It's got the same interface as most of the other, uh, what they call cob or chip on board uh, LED lights from, from Aperture. And this Amaran 200X does an awful lot in a little tiny package, and it costs about 300 bucks. It's, it's really- Whoa. Kind of ridiculous the amount of light output that you get. Uh, a tremendous amount of light for a 200 watt fixture, and you should absolutely check it out if you're in the market for a light. The Amaran 200X, of course, available at Hot Rod Cameras, and uh, reach out to Hot Rod Cameras if you want to check one out. Can I uh, can I just say something? I know I know that this is a sponsor segment, but I I want to kind of go a little bit off book here, a little bit off script. Yeah, I'm working on a on a project right now. I'm directing a project. And it's the first like narrative thing I've directed since the pandemic hit. Mm. And it's interesting to see like in this space of time, Aperture Lights took over everything. Like I would say that at least 80% of the lights that we're using on the set are Aperture. It's a substantial amount, especially like a lot of the big guns when we're trying to get sunlight going through uh, windows or whatever like that. And they always have it set up on a DMX system where the gaffer can basically walk around with an iPad and dial in how much light from each one. It's uh, in watching it like it kind of brings me back to, you know, my film school days when I was working, you know, at the film school I went to Valencia Community College had like all new stuff. Yeah, HMI lights and, and tungsten lights and stuff like that. And never could we have dreamed of this Star Trek, the next generation <laughs> le level lighting control that I'm watching happen on the set. And honestly, it speeds things up. It enhances creativity. It's a better experience, I think, for the actors. The crew doesn't have to lug around such outrageously heavy equipment. And uh, it's been pretty amazing seeing how uh, how these lights that we've been talking about on the show for so long, how they're really you know put to use in the real world by real professionals. And now, short ends. So, Ben, it's our short end time of the show. Uh, what is your obsession this week? What are you all about? What are you What are you into? Well, my real obsession is this project I've been directing, so that's taken up a lot of my time. But I feel like it's something we haven't talked about on the show yet, and I bet we're going to talk about it as a close focus as the inevitability comes towards the industry, which is the Writers Guild strike that mm. most certainly is going to show up this summer. How sure am I? I'm not terribly sure. I don't necessarily know. I don't have a crystal ball, but I lived and worked through the 2007, 2008 Writers Guild strike. In fact, I was making a movie when the strike happened, which meant that my writer could not go to set. We'd, uh, she had turned in her final draft of the script before the strike started. But uh, from that moment forward, she wasn't allowed to work on it at all. And it sucked. Let's just say it sucked. And before that, 
I had done a lot of freelance journalism kind of stuff, and I had written a bunch for Creative Screenwriting Magazine, and they had me write what the editor said was, I want like a Vanity Fair style article about the 1988 Writers Guild strike. Mm. So I, I can pull up the article if you ever want to read it. But I talked to so many people who were involved in the strike on both sides, and I feel like I got a pretty good sense of what was going on. So here's sort of my concern slash prediction. For the first time ever in the history of the Writers Guild, writers are kind of more important than anyone else mm-hmm. in, the eye, in the eyes of the industry. I don't feel like writers are more or less important than they have ever been. They have always been amazingly important. But what's happened since 2007 is the rise of the showrunners. There were showrunners before, clearly, but the fact is that so much of our quote unquote peak TV is run by these showrunners who are, a lot of them do direct, but they are writers. They're writers who produce their WGA. And in the past, it was always the directors who kind of had the kill stroke in the strike. And the DGA, by the way, has never in its history ever gone on strike. And I think in part, it's because the AMPTP companies are kind of afraid of directors and they are less afraid of writers because writing is something everyone does to some degree. So they think they can write, you know, they're like, we don't need to write TV shows. Well, you know, like they're probably right now trying to figure out how to get chat GPT to write the next season of, uh, you know, CSI right. Las Vegas or whatever. Yeah. So writing has always been an undervalued commodity and the Writers Guild has pushed back and gone on strike several times. Right. And SAG too. So there's that. The stakes of this are residuals on streaming and as we talked about earlier streamers don't reveal any of their numbers and even though they have the most exact numbers that have ever existed in the film industry they have the exact fucking numbers they know exactly how many people have watched everything and they also know everything about those people and what else they watched and how long they watched it and when they took a pee and they know everything about you and um (laughs) what you had for dinner And the streamers do not want to pay residuals. And moreover, the strikes before against AMPTP companies were about, those were entertainment companies. Streamers are technology companies, notoriously libertarian run technology companies. Now, I don't know. I I don't know the politics of the people who run the stuff, but they're not wild about unions and they would love nothing more than to break the unions into little tiny pieces and throw them in the ground. So if you're Netflix and you have to make the next Ozark and you've got a showrunner, blah, 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 you know, you're dealing with the Writers Guild, you're dealing with the DGA, you're dealing with the SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, and you're not paying any of them residuals, even though residual income is something that every TV network has had to pay, I believe, since the 1970s to everyone in all of those guilds. And don't get me started on why IATSE doesn't get residuals, because I think they should. Anyway, so I feel like we're going to we're about to see the Writers Guild go to loggerheads with technology companies over streaming residuals. And for the first time ever, the writers are the first to negotiate. The DGA isn't negotiating first. It's the Writers Guild and the Writers Guild is getting in there first. And I think this could be horrific. Mm. Well, you're right. We have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, I, you know, I just quickly Googled it while you were chatting, but uh, the WGA has actually had residuals first negotiated and received back in 1960. So this is not exactly a new thing. Well, is- maybe it's SAG that didn't get it until the 70s, mm-hmm. because like I remember hearing about Sherwood Schwartz uh, bragging about how, you know, none of the Brady Bunch or the Gilligan's Island gang got any residuals for their work at the time. Not, you're you're correct, Ben. 1974, uh, SAG yep. and AFTRA started getting residuals. Yeah. So anyway, I don't want to catastrophize, but I do want to say watch this space and other spaces to hear about how this is coming along because we haven't had a WGA strike since 2007. Those of us who remember it, it uh, kind of shut the town down. I think it went on for, if I'm not mistaken, about four or five months, maybe more. And uh, I'm not saying the Writers Guild shouldn't go on strike or any guild shouldn't go on strike. For all I know, my guild, the Directors Guild, might go on strike. Uh, And also the people I know who are like most entrenched in the industry and have been in it the longest are all saying absolutely 100 percent the strike is going to happen. So a lot of people are saying "Eh, maybe it won't happen. And I don't have a crystal ball. I can't say whether it's going to happen or not. But what I think is going to happen is that the streamers are going to force the Writers Guild's hand by not even coming to the table with a good faith argument about residuals because they don't want to pay them and it's it, it could get ugly yeah that's uh 
that's harrowing. I, I remember the the previous strikes and it, it was uh, it was absolutely terrible for the technical side of the industry. And I knew a lot of people who really didn't work for a long time. So that's uh, that's dire. <laughs> and it's not just like all your TV shows shut down. It's like movies, new movie development. And the other thing is, and I, don't, I haven't necessarily seen this right now, but it probably is happening is in the months ahead the studios and the network start greenlighting shit like crazy so they can have you know their their cupboard can be pretty full of product to help them get through the strike and for those of us who want to work we'll take those jobs obviously and we'll go make those products for them but it, i'm not saying it's blood money or anything like that but it's like you make it knowing like well you know it might be a long winter for a lot of us i still am kind of shocked that iatsi didn't go on strike last year i thought that that was really going to happen and i was impressed that it didn't but I feel like this is going to be I just don't I don't see how either side I cannot imagine either side folding to the other one's demands at this stage in time. Yeah. Well, uh, we will watch this space with interest. Certainly things are going to progress. And I know that you're going to be watching it closely. So uh, I'm sure you'll you'll keep us surprised. Yep, we will do. So, Ilya, on that happy, happy note, what is your short end? I went out and I bought a digital copy of Everything Everywhere All at Once from Voodoo. And I got to say that I watched it at, we had a work screening. It was wonderful. And, uh, you know, people really enjoyed it. I went to log into Voodoo and suddenly the movie was gone. Like the one movie that I'd purchased there was, was no longer there. It and was, thought, it, it was nothing, like, nowhere, all at never, nothing. Yes. It, all, the movie was completely gone. And I thought to myself, well, this could be a problem for, uh, you know, rights or, you know, if whatever, if at some point the place that you buy your content from decides suddenly that it's no longer available, or maybe there's a lawsuit or whatever it is, and they have to stop showing it. If you don't own the physical media on that. And I, I did a quick search online and it turns out a lot of other people have had this problem with voodoo where they bought many movies and then they went back and checked and found that movies that they bought and paid for were no longer there. So I did send a email to voodoo technical support, which got back to me and we're like, really? Whoa, but that's so weird. We don't see anything there. Make sure you don't have any filters applied. And uh, maybe you're filtering your extensive movie library and so that this type of genre or something was excluded. And sure enough, I went back there and suddenly there there the movie was again. Everything everywhere all at once was back in my account. So I think that they weren't fessing up, but some sort of bug or error or something happened where a movie that I I owned and I wanted to reference a scene and I I went to, to go watch it and it wasn't there and I was not feeling apt to go uh, try to buy it again, especially since I already p paid for it once. So this was interesting. I I not had this experience before uh, with Apple TV or with Amazon when I had bought product. And and I on previously on a on a PlayStation, which I used as my Blu-ray DVD player, when they started doing uh, the ability to, to buy and download movies, I did buy one and downloaded it onto my PlayStation. Of course, I don't have that PlayStation anymore. So that you know, shame on me. But here I thought I would try this cloud service and I ran into this hiccup. But this is sort of a long preamble into getting into what is actually my short end, that everything everywhere all at once is back in theaters. And oh, I think yeah. I'm, I'm very excited about that. And this tends to happen right before the Oscars movies come out and not necessarily just in like Los Angeles and New York. It's playing in, in Portland. It's playing in other cities and stuff right now. I am going to go see uh, everything everywhere all at once in the theater to have that experience one more time, because who knows when that's ever going to come out to a theater again. And as much as it is convenient to buy or to rent or to VOD everything everywhere, I'm going to encourage people right now, if you've got the chance to go see it on the big screen and you never saw it, take the opportunity to go see it on the big screen. If you already saw the movie on the big screen, who knows when you'll get this opportunity again. I think it's worth the 10, 15 bucks, whatever it's going to cost you to go see it. Go see it on the big screen because movies don't come around all that often that maybe you have a, a real connection with or that you can you can watch multiple times. And I think this is is one of them for a lot of people. I've talked to a couple of people now who've told me it is their favorite movie or it's in their top five of like favorite movies of all time. So I'm very excited to go out and see it one more time on the big screen before it potentially disappears for a long period of time, even though I own a digital copy and I can watch it in my living room. I, I want to have the theater experience one more time before it's gone. Well, I, yeah, I mean, and I, I can't endorse uh, strongly enough going to see that movie on the big screen. Uh, Larkin Siples cinematography in the direction of the Daniels. It's one of those movies that I think benefits strongly from seeing on a big screen in a theater with an audience, all the things about the theatrical experience to me, come together in, in that movie and 
it might be premature for me to say that it's in my top five of all time because I feel like I like to have a little bit of time to, you know, like three, four years from now, we'll see if, if it still resonates with me the way that it did when I saw it. But I think it's just some unbelievably strong work by some all around, every person in it, every person behind the camera, you know, just really firing on all cylinders. I'm so excited that it, it's up for all these Oscars. And didn't Kihu Kwan win a BAFTA couple days ago. He sure did. Yeah, the BAFTAs just happened. We didn't even talk about that in our in our close focus, but I mean, we, we didn't do a roundup this time. Maybe we'll talk about it, you know, next week on the show. Well, but anyway, it's a movie that deserves your viewership in a theatrical experience. And being that they're doing the Oscar push, I, yeah, I agree. Take advantage of that. Go see it. It's, it's a great movie to see in the theater. All right. So, Ben, that just about wraps us up. Uh, where can people find you? They want to track you down. Well, you can find me at benrock.com. That's where you'll find all my social media stuff. I'm pretty much everywhere people of my age turn up. So, you know, not TikTok. You're everywhere? <laughs> everywhere all at once. Yes. <laughs> uh, for people of my generation. So again, not TikTok. Anyway, Ilya, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. Uh, that's uh, definitely where I'm going to be uh, a lot next week. And next week I'm uh, at the office, uh, you know, grinding it out, getting getting stuff done. And uh, we might do another interview actually in person at the office. So uh, if that's uh, happening, I'll, I'll I'll hit you up and let you know. Um, All right, Ben. Who do we have to thank this week? Who should we uh, be thanking for making this whole show possible? As always, number one uh, is Alana Cody, who hooks us up with all of these interviews and uh, keeps us honest, keeps us churning these out one one a week. And I think it's been a, a, you know just an amazing experience for us. And hopefully our listeners appreciate it. And Alana Cody is the one to thank for that. Uh, we should also thank Ben Katz, who uh, edits us and uh, hopefully this week edit us way down. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, uh, Kaze Alatrakshi, who composed every scrap of music that you heard on this podcast today you can find all of his work at musicbykays.com and for christ's sake somebody send him a message on that site and say that you heard him on here and you think he's good that you don't even need to hire him but if you have a movie or something that you need uh, original music for uh let me tell you you could do worse Kays is amazing i've worked with him several times agreed all right ben uh you want to take us out of this uh this thing <laughs> <laughs> i will thanks for listening this has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.